fake news. This is news you can trust. Maybe they're born with it. Maybe it's Jesus. You're listening to the Babylon Bee. Here are your infallible hosts, Kyle Mann and Ethan Nicole. Yes, welcome to the Babylon Bee podcast, the show where we keep you informed. Correct. Extremely informed. With news. With news and commentary and scathing opinions. And tidbits. And lots of juicy. (laughs) Juicy morsels of information. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing good, Ethan. Well, here we are. We are getting ready for uh, this episode. We got to talk to Scott Adams. So we talked to Scott Derrickson last week. Now Mm -hmm. we're talking with Scott Adams. And then I think next week or a future week, we're going to be speaking with Mike Adams. Yeah, so it's getting really confusing. So we got to keep it straight. We have to talk to Mike Derrickson. To, yeah. Anybody? If anybody's out there that knows a famous, semi-famous Mike Derrickson. Yeah. Or Adam Scottson. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah, the, the Dilbert guy who makes predictions. He's like the Nostradamus of our day and age. He he sits on a on a mountain somewhere and just says... Trump. A mountain that he had fashioned out of... Dilbert comics. Yeah, because he's really rich, right? Oh, out Dilbert. of cash, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that's later in the episode. Um, yeah. What did you do this week? Well, I got sick yesterday, which was horrible. Huh. And it was just like 12 hours. But... Right. Uh, the, like, like vomiting? Like I didn't, but my family was. And okay. I I still not sure I was sick. I'm, I think it was just so every, everybody. Th- yeah, that happened to us. That, and then that's how it went for me too. I was the only one who didn't. Yeah, and I'm just lose like control. But I got really sick. But it just didn't come out. It's like you know it's coming, so you just feel it and you just lie yeah. down. And you're like, it was terrible. But the day before that was fun because you and I went and saw Kellen Erskine. Yeah. The uh, comic who happens to be a latter a, a Latter Day Saint. <laughs> Member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. <laughs> that is a mouthful. And, yeah, he uh, played it nearby us, and uh, yeah, it's always funny how com- comedians are funnier live. Yeah, like he's already funny. Like when you watch him on Amazon, I already laughed pretty hard at that. But he was really funny live. I thought. Yeah, it was really good. Well, some con- I I don't think live makes you funny if you're not funny. Yeah, it's As, just the energy in the room, and you you react more to other people laughing. But you're right. Good comics. You'll if you enjoy him on the on the special on TV yeah. or whatever, you'll enjoy him more live. Yeah, he was very good at like, I don't know, reading the crowd, the crowd's energy and playing off it. And he doesn't just do a script like he he yeah. does things where he asks the crowd to asks he oh. asks the crowd <laughs> to uh, to give him input, throw things at him. He plays off the crowd really well. Yeah, he's clearly a professional. Yeah, but even like, let's say a joke wasn't getting a ton of laughter. He mm-hmm. knew how to just make make it into something funny or yeah. blow right through it and go to the next thing. It was I was pretty impressed by that skill, you know, yeah. that, that comics have to have. And he did a great job. The openers, not so much. I wasn't... Yeah, uh, rough. I'm not going to call them out by name here on this podcast <laughs> and shame them. <laughs> but it was like a Sunday night show, and I don't know how many Christians or... Yeah, <laughs> members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints will go to a Sunday night comedy show. Comedy show. So the crowd was a little small, but mm-hmm. I mean, it it felt it felt yeah, fuller if, than that. If you guys notice that Kellen's coming to your town, you guys got to go see him. Funny, funny man. Yeah, and agreed. Support clean comedy. This guy. He's the clean comic who does birthday parties. He played. He's these guys that open for him. They weren't clean comics. They were trying to use every joke. You know, they could they could make any joke they wanted. Yeah. And they struggled, man. And then he came up there, pure clean jokes, and had the place dying. But you know, exactly what he said on our podcast was I don't I want people to think afterwards, hey, that oh, was, yeah. that was clean. Yeah. You know, and that's exactly what it felt like. It didn't yeah. feel like, oh, he's telling these safe jokes. Yeah. Because the other guys were doing like Trump jokes that weren't yeah. landing and then <laughs> some joke about how ugly her his friend was or something. My friend's so ugly and you know. Yeah. Paying, getting, trying to get people to pay money to date her, and like, yes. like what are you talking about, dude? So Rough. it was good. We had a good time. So uh, me and Ethan want to keep up this appearance as though we like each other. Mm-hmm. So we want you guys to feel like we have this uh, relationship outside of the podcast because that's important. Yes, yeah, so you try to make public appearances as friends. 
<laughs> but then we go somewhere and there's only like 20 people there. We're like, ah, nobody dang, saw us. We need to go to, we should have gone to Switchfoot together and walked yeah, around I did. arm in arm. I did. <laughs> did I record this podcast after I did Switchfoot? I don't think so. I don't know. I think, I think, <laughs> I think when we recorded, I mentioned I'm going to Switchfoot. Like the timeline's night. all messed up for me. How was Switchfoot? Gone? It was great. Cool. Yeah. It was My a lot of fun. Went. My wife went and she saw you there. Yeah. And your wife said, uh, Switchfoot, it was really cute. Yeah. She said it was really cute. Which now I they had the shipwreck theme they do like a that. shipwreck theme right where the guy yeah. comes out and reads their diary of like we've been shipwrecked this many days hey. so like it was a pirate yeah something like that it was good so cool yeah. all right some stories of the week stories of the week but first we have a sponsor this week this episode is sponsored by the christian standard bible specifically their csb study bible This English translation strives to be faithful to the original languages without sacrificing clarity. To inspire you to grow in your understanding and love for God's Word, the CSB Study Bible contains an award-winning array of study resources, including over 16,000 study notes, tools, and word studies. Now available in eight different cover options, including two new covers. Whether you are preparing for future Bible studies or daily readings, This study Bible is the ideal resource for lifelong discipleship. Learn more at csbible.com or visit lifeway.com to order your copy of the CSB study Bible today. (laughs) Frank Fleming's a fan. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if our, will our sponsors appreciate Frank laughing at them? (laughs) I don't know. We could cut through. How dare you? (laughs) Yeah. All right. All right. Stories of the week. Let's do this. Every week, there are stories. These are some of them. Millennial wishes there were some historical examples of socialism we could study to have some idea how it might turn out. If only. If only. (laughs) Yeah, if only there were some examples. Let's say... uh, Like like Sweden? Isn't Sweden ideal? Well, I think the the thing with Sweden is it's like... uh, It's driven by a capitalist economy... Mm-hmm. And they just have like a big social safety net. So I think a lot of times when people say they support socialism, that's what they mean. It's like, yeah, they want that kind of like capitalist with some socialism mixed in there. Yeah. They don't actually want the state to own the mm-hmm. means of production, the memes of memes. production, the memes of production. We need to seize the memes of production, hmm. the may maze of production. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I got nothing to say on this one. <laughs> it's so self-explanatory. <laughs> this is quality. Quality content. This is a Frank Fleming article, right? No, this is no? mine. This oh, is mine, you. dude. Oops, sorry. Oops. I'm often mistaken for Frank Fleming. Aren't you? I was like, oh, this has got to be a Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is probably the greatest honor I can get, though. Yeah, that's a good honor. As a comedy writer, it's like, hey, is this written by Frank Fleming? Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of smile and nod and I go, sure, whatever you want. That was when I, after I made Axe Cop and I was known as the guy who made the comics with a five-year-old, people would check out my other stuff. Be like, is this why your brother too? Did your five-year-old brother write this too? And I'd be like, <laughs> no, no, I just wrote that one. And they'd be like, oh, and they'd walk off all disappointed and not read it. That's kind of an opposite problem. <laughs> yeah, like you're it's not, a little opposite. So they did. They wanted, they wanted. Well, I was to trying to written. think if it was like an insult, like. This looks like a five-year-old wrote it. Yeah. Is that true? And you're like, no. I'm like, oh. I, I wrote it. Oh, you came up with this concept by yourself? By yourself without a five-year-old? And, and, just... and you're a grown adult and you yeah. wrote this? What was the one you did? The was it Chumble Spuzz or something? Yeah. That, was that written by a five-year-old, Ethan? No, it was written by me. Oh. You jerk. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind then. <laughs> yeah, so they should really start writing something like history books, some court, some sort of books. Mm-hmm. Containing like historical information where you could go back and look and see accounts. Yeah, account books. Has it called. been tried? Has real socialism been tried? Have real history books been tried? Yeah. Where we could write down, like, oh, all these countries in South America are explode. Oh, by the way, have you seen, did you see the new Jack Ryan season? No, I'm, I'm like three episodes in. I hardly watch anything now. I'm like, force myself just to watch that. Of season two? Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing to me because it's set in Venezuela. Oh, yeah, and there's like a... Which is collapsing because of socialism yeah. in real life. Yeah, yeah. And they make it the opposite in and the it's show. It's not a secret. <laughs> yeah, in the show, it's like, well, even like, I don't know, episode three or four, they talk about all the specific problems. Huh. You know, they're talking about, oh, we, inflation, 
starvation, you know, mm-hmm. corruption, all the, you know, I'm like, yeah, those are all the problems in Venezuela. And they're like, it's because of this right wing nationalist. <laughs> and the lady that's coming up to, re- to challenge them is like a social, social justice, justice warrior yeah. type. I'm like, what? why, why not just make it like a, a fictional country at that point? Cause I, I can buy into, okay, there's this crazy <laughs> fascist guy and he's ruining everything. I could buy that concept. Right. Mm-hmm. But why set it in something where it's the opposite? It's just, I don't know. It's bizarre to me. Isn't that, I always feel like that's what people in Hollywood expect you to do. Like they want you to set the, the, yeah. your world up as, as it's supposed to be in their mind. Like, huh. like all of Congress is women. The president is a wheelchair bound. <laughs> Pacific Island <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> like everything has to be the world they want it to be. Right. And if you don't set up like that, if you set up as the world is, you're just, you're just perpetrating the horrible world we live mm. in and not, not solving all our problems for us. Yeah. Like you can't, so you can't tell stories about how the world is. You have to tell it how it, how it should be. be. Yeah. Yeah. I liked that. Uh, they did that show. I think it was called commander in chief or something right before Hillary ran. And it was like a woman becomes the first president. I'm like, okay. I get what you're trying to do here. 24 did that. Yeah. 24 always had a first day of the black president before a black president, before Obama. Then they had the female president. She was a horrible president, though. I don't like her. I, you know, I watched like two or three seasons of 24. I don't, when did I she come I was hooked in? on 24, yeah. Yeah. You, the, uh, dun, dun. What was his name? Wait, was that, is that the right noise? The president, the, the, the first president in 24, you really liked him. You're like, man, he's great. You're like, man, I'd vote for a Democrat if that was him. He was a great guy. That was the black guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot his name. His real name is Hayesbert, Dennis Hayesbert. Mm-hmm. I know that because he played a tree frog on Axe Cop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That it's cool? like six degrees of separation <laughs> yeah. from Axe Cop. It's great because this little tree frog's like, Axe Cop. Like, has that deep voice. Anyway. Did you ever watch West Wing? No. It's a good show. I think Rush Limbaugh used to call it like, it was the escapism during the Bush years, like all the. <laughs> oh, that's uh, the new the new twenty four. It's Keeper Sutherland becomes the president. Oh, what's that called? The de- designated designated survivor. Designated survivor. Yeah. That's pure fantasy. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. It's pure. Pre- it, it starts off so good. It's uh-huh. like this really great premise where this like every man just becomes president, and then it just like you can see like the whole idea of the whole show was to become super preachy, and huh. uh, so they like they have all these things come up where it's clearly they're trying to make a show that middle middle america will get hooked on and then they can like be like see how racist you all are <laughs> and see how, how you're polluting yeah. everything and like everything is just like he's he just it just becomes about issues and not about this terrorist plot like the terrorist uh, plot becomes way behind the it really it's so good for the first like six episodes or so i'm like oh finally a new good show and then it just <laughs> no that's terrible yeah, yeah really i think we i don't know if we mentioned it here before but it's like the how how cringy the old preachy Christian movies were, and that's yeah. what, that's what the new you know woke everyone's preaching. We're all getting preached at. Speaking of preaching, we're going on a long time on this first story. Let's go to the next one. ABC News claims story on Epstein was accidentally thrown out, then shredded into tiny pieces and incinerated. Boom! Mic boom. drop. <laughs> I can't drop this mic because it's attached to the. It's on a boom. It's on an arm to you the have to Unscrew it. It's really annoying. Yeah. So there was leaked audio, oh, yeah, or man. not audio, video footage of that anchor that was yeah. on ABC News, who was saying how well I had all this information on Epstein three years ago, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't let me. Uh, they wouldn't let me release it. They told me to cover it up. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and then later she's like. Oh, I was just expressing feelings that normal people have about covering up pedophile stories. And suppressing it's amazing. Them. It was really weird. Like, just that's a normal emotion people have all the time. I have it every day. I'm like, you know, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm just every like, time I cover up information for uh, covering up pedophile stories. Pedoph- it's just a feeling I have sometimes. Who among us hasn't? Yeah, covered up normal human emotion. This this massive pedophile Stress, ring for the frustration and. Pedophile cover-ups. <laughs> Anger. Anger. Anxiety. Yes. Yeah, so I guess supposedly she had information on Prince Andrew, mm. and that was part of the deal was like there was all these connections. And like, well, the royal family doesn't want you to bring this out. It's like, I thought that, you know, that, isn't that their whole rallying cry is like speaking truth to power? Yeah. Like that's what they're always saying, you know, uh, we, we, as journalists, we speak truth to power. Mm-hmm. You know, It's like, yeah, not this time. 
I never know if when people are talking about princes and princesses, I can't remember if it's from a Disney movie or from real a real life thing. What? So you said Prince, oh, Andrew, Prince Andrew. I was having to search. Like, was that Frozen? Your head was like flipping through all the princes, all the princes. and all the Disney movies. <laughs> They're it, Disney movies where they are sexist. Like, name the name of one prince in a Disney movie. I um, remember. Prince. Charming doesn't count. Charming. I, like, I, didn't even, I couldn't even think of it. Like, so thanks for that. That's like Princess Hot. Eric. Or like you, could, you could. Prince Charming. Princess. Prince. Princess Hot. Princess Sexy. <laughs> Yeah, Prince Eric on uh, Prince Eric. Little Mermaid. Boom. His name's Eric? Own. <laughs> With facts <laughs> and logic. It's embarrassing that you know that. <laughs> well, what? And that was a catch-22, and he, he challenged me, and I... Yeah, I guess I don't know what Mulan's uh, dude was named. Just some dude. Just a generic dude there. I can't even think of any movies right now. Yeah. Okay, Prince Hans in Frozen, but he was a bad guy. Even Beauty and the Beast. What's that guy's name? He's the Beast. Prince um, probably got some name. Prince I remember Gaston, the bad guy. Yeah, I remember the bad guy. I can always remember the bad guys. I guess I can never remember the princes. The prince and Snow Aladdin. White. Snow prince White, Aladdin. he's just a piece of meat that in Snow White. Yeah. Oh anyway. well. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So see, I keep going off the topic because I don't pay attention to this news stuff. Yeah. So Epstein I, stuff. <laughs> It's just kind of sick to me. Well, and the, it is the, messed up. The thing that always gets me is like that. I when I keep thinking about this is that this guy was still doing stuff, right? Like, yeah, supposedly. I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly the timeline, but if he was still doing stuff, aren't you like literally allowing people to get abused, right? By not covering. And then as a reporter, wouldn't she go? I, I don't know what her contract's like and any of that stuff. I don't know any of the details, but don't you go? I'm going to take this somewhere else, or I'm going to leak this. I have. You know, don't you have some kind of moral duty it's to probably never i mean that's the thing of this kind of stuff it's it's not the way it is in the movies i assume there's nobody going like no we're squashing this because he pays us well or something it's more like right. like it's not that it's not no, the right time right now but we need to gather more evidence or well it's they they cover it with this feeling that we're gonna we're we'll gonna get cover to it, it we'll get to it eventually yeah, sure. or something or other people are gonna be put in danger and we need to do but it that's right true. That's, or, you know i think that it you know, there's always, it's just never as black and white as movies make it. That's probably true. At least all the times I've covered up for pedophiles. Yeah. I mean, just a normal human thing. Like the last week when you told me to cover up all the pedophile stories and I was like, all right, sir. Cause you're my <laughs> boss. It's a super <laughs> relatable thing. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. <laughs> Next story. Um, I'll let you read it. CNN criticizes pregnant woman for shooting poor, defenseless man who was simply seeking asylum in her home. Is this based on a real story? It is. There was a Florida woman that, uh, sh- I think she shot and killed a, an intruder with her AR-15. Pregnant yeah. woman charging around with an AR-15. And I guess, I, guess, I think she had, uh, I think the intruders were beating on her husband or something. And then she saw it and she went and got the gun and shot him. And then the cops found him dead later mm. on in a ditch or something like that. Jeez. I just made up all those details I'm off the top to, of my I, head. So hopefully that, that's accurate. But yeah. Yeah. You know, they were just seeking asylum. And <laughs> I should have read these notes before we started. You probably should have, <laughs> or at least read the Babylon Bee once in a while. Read the, Check yeah. the stories I've been we spending published. the whole week working on. Oh yeah, you, yeah. So yeah, you've been Christian working cinematic universe. Oh man, I went up today. I'm very excited about that article. <laughs> and you've been working on our uh, few people will read it. You've been working on our best of book. Yeah, which we haven't officially announced. That's what I spend a lot of time on. We're working on a big, pretty Babylon B book with lots of pictures, and it is going to be absolutely amazing, stunning. I uh, Ethan keeps showing me pages from it, and I'm just like. Like I wrote a lot of these articles and I'm just reading them just amazed at how good this thing is. Ethan is redoing all of the photoshops. Yeah, almost all of them. Because our, just because they're not the right size for print. A lot of our early photoshops weren't great and then also um they're yeah, they're not they weren't high resolution. So we're going to get all new photoshops for these and it's just going to be amazing. Yeah, we like a big pretty coffee table book with full of Babylon be fun and joy. Yeah. And also a pregnant woman shot a man. Yeah. A poor defense. With an AR-15. Man. I always wonder if someone, if I had a gun, which I don't yet, because I still you try. You still don't have any guns I'm at trying, all? I'm trying. I'm trying to get yeah. one. It's just so freaking hard in California. 
But uh, I've I, heard it's easier in this. The county we're in is not as. I've I don't think the county matters. County. Oh, because there's still the state laws. Well, I don't think the county necessarily matters. For I've heard it's easier to get concealed. Concealed, carry exactly. In this that, that's what's that's what's different. But mm-hmm. uh, I always wonder if I had a gun, like if I would actually be able to shoot someone that charged in the front door. Yeah, like with all that adrenaline and like. Well, with I, mean, I don't know. I I always think like hey, I'd have to run because <laughs> I don't have any guns in our in our bedroom. I'd have to run like out to the garage. Yeah, hang on a second. Pull it out of the <laughs> sleeve. Find the bullets, which I don't even know where the bullets are. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know that it, I'd probably at the very least try to like aim the gun while it's still in its sleeve at the person and hope they believe it's loaded. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a real gun. <laughs> Inside this giant sock is a shotgun. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other side too. I'm always, you know, I've got a young child in the home. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. I would, my my young child is kind of dumb, you know, and he would definitely be someone to grab a gun. And Well, and you, by law, you're supposed to have a lock in the shot. And if it's a shotgun, you have to have like a lock in the trigger, like a key lock, like right. a padlock. Well, most and, and guns you're supposed to. You know, handguns, you know. have to have them in a case that's locked with a padlock, I believe. That's the, the laws. Yeah, so I don't even know like how how much so how do you get that you fumble the key. Yeah, how much time do you have between realizing oh someone's coming into my house to okay now I'm gonna go yeah. unlock all these. I don't know. Yeah, I assume it was at night. You realize they're in there when they're like standing in front of your bed. Yeah, hang on a second, sir. Be right back. <laughs> all my gold is in the garage. <laughs> Let me go get it for you. Let me get you a bunch of gold. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good plan. Yeah. Now we know how to do it. Yeah. I would actually have to run to my neighbor and say, hey, can I borrow your gun real quick? Well, I, I come who did I? Oh, I think we were talking about this on my other podcast. The uh, the weird feeling of like you should sleep clothed because if somebody does invade your house, like who wants to like ha- get in a gunfight in your underwear? Because mm. most guys sleep in their own underwear, I assume, mm-hmm. especially down here where it's hot. Yeah. And uh, but one thing you could do is you could grab the the comforter off your bed and throw it over the guy so he never sees you and just start hitting him under the comforter. That's one idea. I don't know. I just came up with that. (laughs) Just throw it over him. He can't see anything. (laughs) And then he'll feel, he'll feel really silly and he'll be like, I just, he's like, it's like beating up a ghost. (laughs) Well, we thoroughly covered that story. Oh yeah. Yeah. You want to move on and talk with... Uh, you ready to talk to Scotty Adams? Scott Adams, let's do it. Since it's it's this, it's this Scott month here at the Babylon Bee Podcast. Scott month. <laughs> all right, let's get another Scott going all, here. All Scott November. Mm-hmm. Presenting an exclusive Babylon Bee interview. All right, everybody, we are here. We're, we are interviewing Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert, the... Uh, the comic series, the uh, cartoon. What do you call it, a comic or a cartoon? It's not a, really a comic. It's it's more yeah, like it's, a. Do- it's a, just like a, a Sunday comic. It's just a documentary. Oh, of, it's a documentary uh, of the of, of Office Life of Office Life and business, <laughs> and also author of books. Scott, welcome to the Babylon Bee Podcast. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, my dad works at a at a uh, aerospace engineering company, and he said. Uh, for years, they always wondered uh, how you, you know, if you just had their office like tapped with a microphone or you had some secret camera watching them. That, that's actually one of, one of the most frequent comments I get. And uh, part of that was fueled by the fact that I have a common name. And it turns out that almost every Fortune 500 company in this country, if you looked at their employees, uh, you know, if they have like a million employees or something, you look at them and there, sure enough, there's a Scott Adams there. <laughs> so there were actually a number of Scott Adamses at different big companies who took a lot of heat because people said, well, we know this is you. This is obviously our company. This is your name. It's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're getting people fired because human resources is thinking that they're drawing comics about uh, what's going on in the office. (laughs) You know, uh, jokey aside, I've actually gotten several people fired accidentally because they Uh posted my comic or they they gave it to the wrong person. And it was, I guess people thought it was, I don't know, unbusinesslike or something. (laughs) So, yeah, people actually have been fired for that. Oh, wow. Well... Pouring out for them. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I have I, I make comics, and I I tried for a while to get into making funnies, like Sunday comics. Whatever you, what do you call them, newspaper comics? Back when 
I don't even know when the last time a new one was made, like a new one actually got picked up. I, I, I figure you were one of the, are, were, you, were you one of the last? Do they still get <laughs> no, picked the, up? The major cartoon syndicates still launch the same number of comics they ever did, but it, it just gets harder and harder for somebody new to break through. Yeah. So you, you don't notice because a new launch might be in 35 out of 2,000 newspapers and mm, none of them are in the big market. So huh. you just don't even notice that they existed. Yeah, and I guess I don't even read the newspaper anymore, so I wouldn't even know if there is new cartoons. Huh. But, but but that said, there are there are some big famous ones since me. Pearls Before Swine came after yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm bad to remember the names of cartoons, but there, there are several that are pretty big, quite successful, that came after Dilbert. So is this like was cartooning a thing that you saw yourself saw yourself making making your living doing or I know that you didn't start out doing it but was it a uh, like I am curious about that about that journey real quick Well when I was very young say 6 years old I thought I wanted to be a famous cartoonist and specifically I wanted to be Charles Schultz with <laughs> peanuts and that was my goal. And I would you know, draw pictures. You know, I'm seven, eight, nine years old. When I reached about the age of 11, I realized, wait a minute, there are about six billion people in the world and there's only one Charles Schultz. What are my odds? And I decided to go the rational route and, you know, just study in school and go to college. I was economics major. I thought it might be a lawyer or a businessman or something. Mm -hmm. I worked for corporate America for 16 years, but I hit a sort of a a glass ceiling there. Um, It was a a weird period during the, uh, I guess this was late 80s and 90s, uh, where both my major employers told me that they couldn't promote me because I'm white and male. Oh. And uh, they, they told me that directly, by the way. When when I tell this story, people <laughs> always say, well, you're you're reading between the lines. And, and I say, no, I was called into the office and I was told that the order had come down, that no white males will be promoted until further notice. Now, the reason was actually a fairly good one, which was, you know, <laughs> if there could be, uh, because there was no diversity in either of those companies in senior mm-hmm. management and they got caught. So the, the local press put pressure on them. Hmm. And at the first company, it's the reason I left the bank. I was at Crocker Bank. So I, I left soon after. They told me I couldn't get promoted. Went to the phone company, thought, well, I'm safe now. It's all going to be good. And one day my boss called me in the office and gave me the same speech for the same reason. The, the press had noticed they had no diversity in senior management. So they just said, well, until further notice, if you're white and you're male, you're not getting promoted. Wow. So that was that was about the time I said, maybe I should try to do something that doesn't have a boss, and uh, you know maybe do a little work on the side and see if I can get something going. So it was, cartooning wasn't the only thing I tried on the side; it was just the only thing that worked. Is that when you, you know, started I, to learn how to do hypnotism? Because then you could be like, "You will hire me. I will become CEO." Uh, that was even before uh, cartooning. Oh. So I did first. Uh, that was just building what I call my talent stack. <laughs> I tried to, I tried to develop skills that work well together. And you could, you can add persuasion and hypnosis to just about anything, and it makes you makes you a more valuable person, uh, employee, I guess. And uh, so I. Tried cartooning, and the short version of the story is that worked out. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> cool. So, how do we know that you're not hypnotizing us right now to ask all the right <laughs> questions that make you look good? Because you asked that question. <laughs> yes, let's see what I did there. Oh man, but but that's exactly what you would say to make people think. Kyle's eyes have little spirals in them right now. What are you doing to him? <laughs> Why are you so amazing, Scott Adams? <laughs> Everybody buy Scott's book. <laughs> we have stacks in the office. Um, yes. So no, you're, you're not being hypnotized. It just feels that way. As far as you, <laughs> you just it's just your personality. So we have a, your new book here, Loser Think. Uh, I will completely admit that I have not had a chance to read it, but we're looking through the bullet points here and stuff like that. But I like the title. I like the guys in the bubbles. 
Yeah, you write good titles, Scott. Yeah, you're good at titles. <laughs> and covers. Uh, I've been told that by my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to dive in, what do you think? Sure, yeah. So you, I mean, through Dilbert, you kind of use mockery, humor, satire to, I mean, do you feel like people actually change their, um, change their ways based on humor? Because that's what we do. You know, we write humor and it's sometimes you feel like you're just writing jokes. Sometimes you wonder if you're actually impacting culture, impacting people at all. So I think you talk a little bit about in Loser Think about how people have, you know, people as, as big as like Elon Musk have mentioned Dilbert as an influence to how that, the, how they tell their people to manage. So is that something that, uh, that you, is that a purpose that you see for humor, satire, cartoons? Yeah, mockery is one of the most powerful forces in the world. It's right it's right up there with fear and, and greed, I think. And people don't want to be mocked. It, it's one of the things we like the least. <laughs> and so if you can create a situation where if you do X, you, you will definitely get mocked, a lot fewer people are going to do X because nobody wants to walk into the kill zone. So, uh, as you mentioned, Elon Musk at one point uh, sent out a little uh, email or some kind of communication to his staff uh, saying the little rules that he wanted them to follow to have a proper culture at the company. And one of the rules was don't do anything that would end up in a Dilbert comic. <laughs> and uh, the, the power of that is, uh, in the, the context of why I put it in the book, the power of that is that by creating the name and, and the property Dilbert, everybody had a common reference. So he didn't have to go into detail. Well, in these situations, and here's what I mean, and here's a thousand examples, because everybody kind of holds in their mind what a Dilbert situation looks like and, w and what isn't one. And we all recognize them when we see them. So it became a shorthand. And the, the context was that uh, loser think creates its own set of shorthand labels for things to help you mock people away from bad thinking patterns. Do you think that he smoked weed on Joe Rogan's show inspired by Dilbert? <laughs> I don't, I don't Probably mean. not. Uh, <laughs> although, uh, although I I did smoke weed on Joe Rogan's show before he did, so maybe oh. I inspired him. Yeah, see, maybe. Man, how come we haven't been on Joe Rogan's show to smoke weed yet, Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are a Christian website, Ethan. <laughs> uh, so loser think, because you wrote Think Big League. I started reading that because I realized I, I didn't realize that that was we we're talking to you about loser think, and that it wasn't the other one or. Is it that, it's not think big? It was big. Are, you, are you telling me you read the wrong? I was book reading the wrong that? book in preparation. <laughs> you show up to school having done the wrong homework. Yeah, win bigly, win bigly. That's it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really unprepared, but Kyle's over there I, looking at your book right now. I, yeah, I like how you quote uh, you quote Rep. Eric Swalwell. Remember that guy? That was his big. He, he, he's a. Uh, He's always good for an example because he, he does a lot of things that make you say, uh, okay, I got to talk about this now because there's some, there's something deeply wrong with this. I need to talk about this. <laughs> Is he the guy who ran for president? Short, yeah. Like he's briefly? the guy who, he's the guy who wanted to nuke everybody. Nuke everybody. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's, he's my local uh, representative. Really? Hmm. Oh, lucky, lucky yeah, you. I've met him a few times. We have common friends. So, uh, yeah, so you quote him as saying, uh, destruction of evidence is consciousness of guilt. At this point, please show me evidence that Donald Trump is not working for Russia. And you're using this as an example of, uh, of how well, it's that, rarely it, possible to, to prove that something isn't true. <laughs> right. and, and the funny thing is that he's, he's a lawyer. So he obviously was completely aware of, uh, wow, well, I don't want to read his mind. But one assumes that a lawyer knows the most basic thing about the law, which is you prove somebody did something. You don't prove somebody didn't do something. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I didn't even see this. You actually you, you included his tweet about nuking everybody in your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, and I defended him about uh, that tweet because it was such so obviously just hyperbole. And people took it seriously. And then later people said, when I called people out for taking it seriously, they said, well, we know it wasn't real, but we 
we like making a target out of them. So mm-hmm. people don't even respond based on what they actually really believe. They they respond based on how it's going to hurt somebody. Yeah, that happens all the time, especially with Trump. He's clearly joking around or being hyperbolic or just being Trump, and everybody has to they they put their monocle on and start freaking out and taking everything completely seriously. He's saying. <laughs> I'm not, sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure where the monocle reference comes in, but they, it's still you know, oh, 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 dear. Yeah, they're they like can't. sipping tea sipping and tea. Oh. clutching at pearls. Oh. And. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's that's a complete picture. Monocle. They have to put the monocle on <laughs> so that it can pop. It pops out. They're so freaked out, it pops. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Trump pops a lot of monocles. Uh, so what's some of your favorite examples in recent history of loser think? that We, we got this Swalwell one. What are some more... Uh, to kind of you know piggyback on your book here well one one of them i tell uh i tell people not to act like pundits and use the the techniques they do because they're, they're advocates one of the things that pundits like to say is don't normalize that um don't normalize that yeah now uh, the word is meant to sort of close down the thinking it's like uh, okay we're done don't normalize that but mm-hmm. it makes you uncritically think past the main question, which is, is the behavior good or bad? Because if it's bad, well, you don't want to normalize that. Mm -hmm. But if it's good, of course you want to normalize it. So it makes you think past whether it's good or bad. And now in the case of Trump criticizing the press, if this were the old days when the, the press was just trying to get the news right, criticizing the press under that condition would be probably bad. You wouldn't want to you know, make the free press any less capable because of criticism. But uh, in our current model, where the press is really driven by emotion and clicks, in other words, they, they present um, material that drives your emotions up, and that's how they make their money. In that kind of world, where the, the facts are less important than how excited you got about reading the, uh, the article, the president's criticism seems entirely appropriate. Wouldn't you want your president to criticize things that are broken when those broken things are really, really important to the to the American public's health? So, of course, you would. So that's exactly what I would want to normalize. I would like to normalize presidents criticizing important things that are broken that need to get fixed. So there's a there's an example of loser think. So, yeah, I mean, you were one of the first people to uh, to predict that Trump would win. And I think at the time, his his odds were like 2%, <laughs> according to <laughs> Nate Silver and some of the other people. So, I, I mean, how did you predict that? Well, I have that background in hypnosis that I mentioned, and I've been studying the ways of persuasion for decades as part of my job as a writer. And uh, I noticed early on that he had these uh, high-grade persuasion talents and I imagine that other people couldn't see it because if if you haven't studied that field, you would think he's just you know talking and bullying and whatever else people think, but and you would lose the technique. But about the time that he labeled Jeb Bush as low energy, uh, that's the day that I I, I predicted <laughs> he would be president because <laughs> even long long before. And here's you know if if you want to see how powerful it is to have this. Uh, that talent of understanding persuasion. The day I saw the tweet, I said, Bush is done uh, you know, publicly. I, I tweeted that. And that was it. That was the end of him. His, his poll numbers uh, stopped there and went down until he was out of the race. And I could see that clearly because what Trump did was they took somebody who was this calm, cool, collected, executive type, very experienced, You know, people thought, okay, that's exactly who you want. You want somebody who's calm, collected. They're not some kind of crazy person jumping around. But the moment that Trump labeled him low energy, and you (laughs) can see the contrast between Trump's high energy and his, you could no longer see him as anything except sort of sleepy and tired and and boring. (laughs) And so Trump used his skill at branding to literally brand the top a dynasty in the United States out of office. And then and then he branded everybody else out of office, including Hillary. So when you see that happening, uh, the first few times you, you might say, well, you know, blind squirrel finds a nut. He got lucky. You know, he was just a bully in a workout. 
But after three years of it, well, four if you count the campaign, uh, it's so consistent and it works so well that uh, it's getting harder and harder to deny that it's technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so crazy looking back that, I mean, the the amount of candidates he's up against, it just seems so like, of course, he's not going to win. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I'm reliving it as you talk about it. (laughs) Strangeness of it all. And you qualify yourself. Uh, yeah, from my perspective, it was like he brought a, a machine gun to a cage match. So I'm looking at a guy with a machine gun against an unarmed guy with his fist, and I'm yeah. saying, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I, I'm going to say the machine gun beats the guy with the fist, and that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think part of what we've seen, too, is that people, they protest against that kind of humor and branding too much. Like you see, a lot, people start fighting back against it. It's like, no, I'm not low energy, or no, I'm not that, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes it worse. Like, oh, yeah, Rubio. If you don't play along with it, you're you, you just look you, you know it look like Trump's having a great time, and you're just the serious guy in the room. Yeah, and it's obvious that uh, Trump has branded Biden out of the race too. Now, Biden might have taken himself out of the race just by being Biden, but <laughs> when he started calling when he started calling him Sleepy Joe, <laughs> yeah. it was just it was brilliant um, sort of trash talk. That, that you might see in a sporting event, because if you tell somebody that they're that they're sleepy, they're going to have to show that they're not. And he w- he would have exhausted Biden, who was a certain age and <laughs> certain energy. And and they were trying to keep Biden. in. it's like, well, you know, Joe, maybe you could just have one event today, and then you know, it's nap time. And it was obvious that they were sort of keeping him on the on the short schedule. So as soon as Trump says he's he's sleepy, you start saying, well. That's not many events you're going there to there, Joe. Otherwise, nobody would have even noticed. But then, then Trump uh, uh, upgraded it to slow, sl- slow, sleepy Joe. <laughs> and slow is such a slow is a, a, a total hypnosis term because you can you can interpret it any way you want. So it's open endedness and its ability to, for the people who hear it to say, "Oh, I know what that means," and they. They just in, they inhabit the word with their own experience, and that's what makes it powerful. Everybody's got their own interpretation, and it all fits in there. What does slow mean? Does it mean he's slow to get around to stuff, slow on the campaign, or is he mentally declining, which I think most people would take it to mean that. But you know, if he had said something like, um, he's too old, people would say, well, you're pretty old. If he had said something like, well, I think he's got Alzheimer's, people would say, well, maybe you have Alzheimer's. But when you say slow, you can't really use that against Trump. So that that's, you know, when you think to yourself, okay, he's just throwing out names. But he does it so well engineered that there, there are things that can't be thrown back at him. And they're open-ended so people can, you know, kind of interpret them the way they want. And it's always bad. That's just really good engineering. So his his branding skills are better than anything you've ever seen, probably. Hmm. So you're saying he's playing 4D chess and the rest of us are playing tiddlywinks. <laughs> I'm not sure if you know, I'm the person who came up with that uh, really? as a description of Trump's technique. It, I didn't it know kind that. of caught on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's come full yeah. circle now. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think I said 3D chess and then the people who are mocking him started turning it into, uh, you'll see this in CNN even still. Just uh, I saw it just the other day. Somebody will say, and his supporters say he's playing 27D chess, but obviously <laughs> he's just a clown who's blundering around and keeps getting lucky 700 times in a row. So that's <laughs> sort of the CNN take. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm never sure if it's intentional or not, but it does seem like Trump does something, some blunder, and you, you see it as a total blunder. It would sink any other politician. And then the left or whoever opposes him does something even worse, you know, and it's just, <laughs> and it's like he always somehow manages to come out on top and it, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, you're reminding me of my favorite uh, quote recently from uh, Mike Cernovich, because he would talk to Democrats who would say, you know, oh, yeah, uh, the Democrats will win this time. Trump will be kicked out of office. And he has to remind them that Trump is actually running against a specific person. We don't know what it is yet, but he's going to run against an actual person. And once you have the direct matchup, 
It's just going to be lights out. Trump is just going to annihilate whoever it is. The, the only reason that any of the Democrats are still standing is that he's he's holding fire, waiting for waiting for the designated target. Now, you qualify yourself in your win bigly, winning bigly. I'm sorry if I can't. The word bigly is in the title of your book. <laughs> uh, win what, bigly. Win bigly. And you say you, you, you start off by listing off how how far left you are on a lot of stuff. Like you're very, I think you call yourself like ultra liberal or something like that. Uh, Left, left of Bernie, left of Bernie. So you are, you are like a commie. Uh, (laughs) So, but I'm curious because when you talk about Trump and this is why I think, I think a lot of people, uh, especially on the left, get all upset about you. You do, you sound a little giddy. Like you sound like you admire the guy. Like, do you, do you, are you a fan of Trump and or is it just in certain aspects? I, I'm a total fan of his uh, skill. I'm a uh, very much. I enjoyed. I got to meet him a year ago. He invited me to the Oval Office, and oh, wow. I had this in- incredible experience of literally sitting in the Oval Office while the President of the United States, the most interesting one we've ever had, <laughs> is sitting on the other side of the the resolute desk, and we're just shooting the breeze for half an hour. And I, it was the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. I'll never oh, be able bet. to top that. But but having said that, it's very difficult to spend a half an hour chatting with him and not coming away really, really liking him mm. because, you know, he's, he's, you know, the leader of the free world, you know, the most important person on the planet. And when he talked to me, and I'm sure everybody has the same experience because I can't, you know, I couldn't imagine it would be specific to me. You have the experience that nothing else in the world matters except you at that mm. moment. And, it, and it's really, uh, I got to tell you, it's a powerful thing. He's not the only president who could do that. You know, Bill Clinton yep. was famous for that. Uh, Obama, I'm sure, had the same thing. So, you know, when, when you reach that level, mm-hmm. uh, half an hour chatting with somebody like that, you walk away thinking, I like this person. Yeah. So, yes, yes, I sense. undeniably like him personally. And I'm a huge fan of his technique. But I do criticize specific things that I would have done differently or I wish weren't happening. So, um, how, how many swastikas are hanging up in his office? <laughs> uh, well, all I saw Just was a rough the number. Carpet. <laughs> what, 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 what I got the tour of the, uh, the Oval Office, um, Ivanka was nice enough to, to introduce me to the president and show me around before we chatted. And she was telling me about the, the furniture choice in the Oval Office. Like apparently each president gets to choose from various uh, stored historical items like the couch and the, the carpets and the drapes or whatever. And he, he had the, the Bill Clinton carpet uh, in the sitting area of the Oval Room. And I was thinking, somebody needs to blue light that thing. Because... <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I I don't know what kind of cleaning they do for the White House carpet, but you know I want the deep clean. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we got to send that puppy out to the dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is Trump going to win again? Is that what you're telling us right here, right now, Scott? Uh, I would say that unless there's some big surprise, and of course we live in a in a world where big surprises happen once a week, but if something big happened. Any, anything's possible. But if, if we just straight line it and say, well, Trump's going to run against one of those candidates who's already in the race, uh, Trump wins big. I, I can't imagine him losing in that case. There, there it is, everybody. There it is. Place your bets in Vegas. What other predictions now, do you have for now, the To future? be fair, I, I did predict a year ago that uh, Kamala Harris would get the nomination. This was before I learned that she's the worst campaigner in the history of all campaigns. I've never (laughs) seen anybody worse. Now, in all fairness, I'd seen her doing her interrogations, you know, in the Senate of various people who are testifying and stuff. And she looked strong and leaderly and effective and smart. And I thought, okay, if you've got all that going for you and you're a woman and you're a person of color and you're a senator and you're a Democrat, well, that's the full package. And then she gets on the campaign trail, and it looks like she's campaigning for the principal of your school. <laughs> you know, all her campaign ads are like in a classroom talking to some kids. 
And it's not as if education and children aren't really, really important. But if you're so incompetent that the visuals and the, the image that you're transmitting is that you're running for school principal instead of president of the United States, you don't have even the basic talent to be president. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. How some people... By the way, yeah, by the way, she's the only person in the race I would say that about. Huh. Others have pol- policies I don't agree with, but they certainly have the talent and the smarts and the ability. But she she really stands alone as being completely incompetent. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, some people, when they get on the campaign trail, they, they just, it doesn't work for them. Like, I remember Ben Carson thinking he's going to do great. And then when he got on the campaign trail and debates and stuff, it was rough. It was rough to watch. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's a perfect example. Um, I thought the same thing. I thought, wow, you know, surgeon, smart, yeah. African-American guy on the Republican side. And, and, He's got and this. I, He's I, I don't think people believe this, but the Republicans are really ready for a black candidate. Totally. Like, I don't think anybody I don't think anybody on the left believes that to be true. But if you had, you know, some kind of a, uh, let's say, Colin Powell, if he been full Republican. Um, cert- certainly the Republicans would have backed them all the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So uh, your, your book, Loser Think, I feel like we're we're dodging around it a lot. I really want to like get into, because uh, I'm fascinated by the, t- the idea of just thinking about thinking, like, you know, stepping back from the way you approach things, uh, the way that you're, even culturally, you're taught to think about things or to react to things. And to go, oh, wait, that was really dumb. And that seems to be kind of the goal of your book. Would you like to hear some examples? Please. So here are just a few of the things in the book. One one of the things I warn against is the mind reader um, problem, where you imagine that you can read the mind of somebody you don't even know, some (laughs) political figure, for example, and that even though the things they're doing are perfectly acceptable, you're sure that their thoughts are selfish and impure and there's something bad that's going to happen because you can tell what they're thinking. Mm. Now, it sounds ridiculous when I say this, but it's one of the most common things you see. You scan the headlines and it's not uncommon that a quarter of the headlines are somebody assuming what somebody else is thinking Mm. and acting like that that's a reasonable thing to do. Now, if you've ever been in any kind of a relationship ever, you know that even the person closest to you, your, your spouse, your girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, they can't tell what you're thinking. They're wrong all the time. You can't tell what they're thinking. You're wrong all the time. Why does that get better when you're judging a stranger on the other side of the world, somebody you've never met? Obviously, it doesn't. We're, we're terrible mind readers. So that's one of the things I caution against. And and you see that I put you know words on it. I call it the, the mind reading problem. So there's something to mock. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one I talk about all the time is analogies. Analogies are perfectly good for explaining a new concept. So if you're going to say, explain to me a zebra, I might say, well, you know, you start with a horse, but imagine it has, you know, black and white stripes. But people use analogies to predict, and they're not meant for that. For Hmm. example, you know, people say uh, that uh, just because your cat has markings under its nose that look like a little Hitler mustache, that doesn't mean your cat is going to invade Poland. Now, when (laughs) I use that example, when I use that example, people usually say, come on, that's ridiculous. You know, nobody does that. And then I point out that when President Trump criticized the press, the most common response was, well, there he goes, just like a dictator. The next (laughs) thing you know, concentration camps. Oh, we, yeah. we can predict, we can predict from this behavior, this analogy that he's, he's analogous to a dictator. And therefore we predict full on concentration camps and dictatorship. And of course that's absurd. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It feels like it's everything, everything he says or does They're like, Oh, I think Hitler did that somewhere. Let's go check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, then there's the laundry list, uh, persuasion that I like to mock. We saw recently, it's very common, we saw recently with Alyssa Milano, she did a tweet in which she listed nine reasons that President Trump should be impeached. Now, one of the tells for not having one good reason is if you list nine of them. Because people who have one strong killer reason (laughs) will will, will be clever enough to know, well, it's just a tweet. 
let me let me pound this one good reason and I'm done. I don't need another reason because this one just makes the case. <laughs> if you need nine reasons, you are sort of signaling that you understand none of them are none of them are really strong. So I recommend that when you are pro- when you're um, faced with that and you're trying to argue against it, don't go all whack a mole and try to debunk each of the nine because when you get to the ninth thing. They always repeat, and they start at the first one as if you hadn't just talked about it. And that, that's been my experience. Hmm. So instead, just say, well, don't have time for nine items, but tell me what is your strongest point on the list? And would you agree that if I can debunk your strongest point, you'll rethink the rest? And that's the best you can do is to give them, you know, assuming that you actually can debunk their strongest point. Mm-hmm. Uh and if it's a laundry list persuasion, you probably can. It probably isn't going to be hard because they're all weak points. Then uh, you've you've affected their confidence, and maybe later they can go back and change their mind. It's hard to change people's mind in the moment. Hmm. So those are those are some of the many uh, examples of loser think. What about using the clap emoji in between every word that you tweet? That's that's not is that how's that work? Is that good? <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of anti-emoji except for the <laughs> basics. Yeah, I, I I don't like too many hieroglyphics in my tweets. You know, I don't, I don't want to go full Egyptology. It's like, okay, all right, there's the mm-hmm. there's a hat, there's the turd. Um, we got the turd hat, the eye. Oh yeah, uh, I'm piecing it all together. I'm praying for a turd eye. No, I don't know what it is. I give up. What's the zucchini doing here? <laughs> so. I was at one of those little girly shops yesterday because my kid, I was with my kids and they wanted to go into like unicorns and cotton candy toys. There are so many poop toys now. It's all, but they're all rainbow colored, like rainbow poops and blue poops and pink poops. Like it's really weird that, that feces has become such a popular icon for, for little girls. Well, you know, once once farts became the primary comedic uh, tool for every every kid, like every Disney movie would have when did like, that? You know, farting or something. You know, you got to figure somebody's going to try to take it up a level. They're like, yeah. all right, farts are very very entertaining for a certain subset of the population. Farts are hot what right now. Do, <laughs> yeah, what can we do to refresh this a little bit? Well. Let's take it up a level, a creative level. We'll go full turd. Full turd. Never go full turd. Never go full turd. <laughs> yeah, we can't wait till something else, you know, like vomit or something. Like a bunch of vomit pillows going around. What? To, just just to, I uh, just saw a pra- packaging. I just saw a packaging for a product that I guess is part uh, turkey, part duck, and instead of calling it a, a duck key, I guess that was one one option, they went with uh, uh, you know, tur-duck. Tur-duck. Except tur- the first four <laughs> words are turd. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've and, heard of tur-duck. And the last letters are uck. Tur-duck. Yeah, tur-duck. I wonder how many people are buying tur-duck. <laughs> Not me. Yeah, they definitely didn't run that by like a 13-year-old kid. Because <laughs> they would have caught that. <laughs> or... Or, or me, which or, is basically the same <laughs> Basically thing. the same idea. <laughs> so uh, what are Alyssa Milano's chances of taking the, the White House? <laughs> uh, you know what's the funny thing is if she entered the Democratic race tomorrow, she'd be polling in the top four. <laughs> 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 because, uh, strangely enough, I have a lot of respect for Alyssa Milano's political work. Uh, she gets the same diminishment that I get. No matter what I do, I've written you know, three uh, best-selling books on different topics of you know proving your life and persuasion and now loser think. And uh, online, people still say, and so the cartoonist says something. Let's let's all ignore the cartoonist. What do cartoonists know? Mm-hmm. And Alyssa Milano goes the same thing. It's like, actress Alyssa Milano. It's like, she's done so much in the political realm. She's more like a political activist. Why not call her that? She's been very effective for her side. So even if I don't agree with anything she says, I got to give her props. She's putting in the work. She sacrificed her career because you don't get the same good jobs once you get into the political sphere. So I actually have a lot of respect for her, but just disagree with some of the opinions. Yeah, I mean, and you, you know, when you kind of moved into the political sphere, how did your audience react? Did you, did you all of a sudden make like, 10 times as much money for speaking out or did you lose some audience? Uh, well, my income went down by about a third 
and I lost 75% of my friends and, and a whole lot of money. And it's dangerous to go in public now. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't accept a speaking engagement on a university, for example. Jeez. I would consider that phys- physically dangerous for me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I had a lot of costs. But, you know, I, I didn't intend to be political. I started out just by writing about Trump's uh, persuasion skills. Because I thought, oh, I can see something that maybe other people don't have a window on because they don't have that same background. And it was so popular, it became hugely viral. Because what I did was, accidentally, I explained why Donald Trump makes sense. Meaning that people were looking at him and saying, hey, crazy clown, random guy. Mm -hmm. And then I did a persuasive explanation about why this is all technique. And not only is it technique, it's the best I've ever seen. And not only that, he's going to be your next president. And people read that and thought, oh, that's not the way I was seeing this. And a lot of people started buying into that frame. And indeed, that's the frame that was the most predictive. Well, I think a lot of people think that just by saying that, you're persuading people to vote somehow you're you're i think that they take when they're in that kind of tribal state of mind you can't acknowledge that you can't say that well they're correct i i asked in a tweet one time how many people i had personally influenced to to vote for trump and i think mm, i forget the exact number but it was a whole bunch of people i think (laughs) 1500 people answered the tweet and said that they they voted for trump because of the way i explained him now imagine extrapolate that that's just the people who saw the tweet Mm -hmm. answered the tweet are on my twitter feed and there were 1500 of them my best guess i may have moved quarter of a million people Hmm. shame on you so when (laughs) so you know what the funny thing is that when hillary complains about all the reasons she lost the election she never mentions me that's (laughs) the number yeah sad that's like it That's the line. So what's some loser think that you see happen on the right? Just, you know, I'm curious if uh, common mistakes we make in our thinking, uh, people that are more conservative. Well, people will be surprised that loser think tries to balance that out. So it's not anti-left or anti-right. I try to show a little on both. One of the examples is the idea of friction. And people like to act as though friction doesn't change behavior. But in the real world, if you make anything harder, fewer people are going to do it. You, there's almost no variance to that. That's, mm-hmm. that's what friction does. It makes you less likely to do it. So when we talk about gun control, you'll hear people on the right say, gun control doesn't work because then you know, only criminals will get guns. But that's uh, ignoring the fact that friction works really every time. You could argue that it doesn't work well enough, but to argue that it has no effect is ignoring everything we know about humanity and the entire history of of people. Friction matters. Now, a bad law, of course, isn't going to help anybody, and it's still true that criminals will get guns. But certainly there, there are situations in the middle where there's somebody who wasn't a hardened criminal, but they got an idea to shoot up a school, and maybe if it had been a little harder to get a gun, yeah, maybe it would, time had gone by and they changed their mind. Maybe they'd say, ah, it's too hard to get a gun. It would put me, might flag me as one of those people. So friction just always works. And uh, people on the left and the right like to pretend it doesn't. It's, mm-hmm. it's the same argument for the wall, by the way. The the wall on the border with yeah. Mexico. Those people say, the people on the left say, well, a wall's no good because mm-hmm. drugs will still get through. That's not the right argument. <laughs> Nobody's trying to stop all the drugs. You, you know, you could put a lock on your house, but it doesn't stop all the burglaries. You know, uh, you could mm-hmm. carry your own gun for self-defense, but it doesn't stop all those people with guns from getting shot by somebody else who has a gun. So friction is what you're trying to create. Try, in the case of the wall, you're really just trying to reduce the amount of human manpower and people power. I guess manpower is sexist, right? Human power? <laughs> mm-hmm. Woman power. Uh, you're, yeah, you're, you're trying to re- reduce the amount of people you need, and they can be allocated toward those places where you really need people, and the wall can do some of the work that people would have done. Mm-hmm. So, friction. That's a good example. Okay. Well, I mean, I see that in my own experience, because 
I can't buy a gun in California. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> they, they, they put up they put up so many hurdles; it's just almost impossible. <laughs> but you can, you, buy- know, you know, that's true. I live in California, and uh, I was recently going to get a handgun, and I started looking into it. It's like, oh, that's a lot of work. that's a lot of work. So I cannot. I cannot add to my arsenal easily. Yeah, it's like so, you, you got to take the written exam and. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I like to tell everybody I'm very pro Second Amendment because I think it reduces the number of uh, home invasions in my house. <laughs> <laughs> you just oh, you just tell people that. Yeah, I, I put up the Gadsden flag. I put up the uh, you know, don't tread on me, <laughs> and then people just assume uh, I have a ton of guns. Yeah. Yeah, anybody who comes to my house has to assume that I'm armed and ready. That that would be your smart assumption. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's say that Hollywood producers came to you and said they're going to do the gritty live action reboot of Dilbert. <laughs> What's the cast going to look like? Oh, the cast. Oh, um, uh, I'm really bad at remembering the names of actors. Who was the actor who played the the young son on Arrested Development? Do you oh, remember him? Yeah, Michael uh, Cena. Michael uh, Cena. It is Center. Cena. Right? Oh no, Se- is it? Yeah. Shoot. Something. Anyway, like that. I, I actually Sarah. Uh, Sarah. Sarah. That's right. Sarah. Michael. Sarah. Yeah. I I absolutely love him as a comedic actor. I'd like to see Jack Black play the the boss oh yeah uh, um, I can see that you know, Kathy Griffin was the voice of Alice when when it was an animated show um, but and I suppose she would still be a great choice for the TV show so those are the ones that jumped to mind would that be gritty though I'm thinking gritty yeah it's got to be like <laughs> Liam Neeson gritty. as Dilbert Dil- yeah Dilbert's down on his luck you know <laughs> it's got to be like his the Joker is- <laughs> yeah yeah his family has been wiped out. Yeah, he's yeah, seeking exactly. revenge. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking well, Joker, where all the media would freak out and say this movie's going to cause everybody to shoot yeah, everybody. Yeah, office up. shootings. Yeah. <laughs> good, joke. Good, good, so, uh, good joke. Good joke, Kyle. Dark. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there there probably won't be a, a Joker version of Bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he's shooting down my hopes and dreams here. <laughs> Yeah, we used to gather around and watch the TV show when I was growing up. Joker? No, the the cartoon of Dilbert. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Really? See? Well, you, have you got a real fan here. Excellent taste. <laughs> That's it. So, I think one of the main things you talk about, at least early on in this book, is you talk about how we have these we have these bubbles, and one of the reasons we keep going back to lose or think mm-hmm. is because everybody in our you know, we never we never break out of our way of thinking because we're in this like bubble or this echo chamber. So, what are some ways that we can like break out of that? And do you think that's like a do you think that's a root of these kind of problems? And and how can we break out of that if if we're in a bubble like that? I was expecting more turd questions. But and, I can I can <laughs> and do also this poop. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, so I talk in loser think. I, I uh, advise people to make sure they don't get locked in one news silo. So don't watch just the news on the right or just the news on the left. Mm -hmm. If you're not sampling the other side, you really don't know what the other side is even saying. So you can't evaluate whether uh, you're hearing the best argument because you haven't heard the other argument and you're probably lacking context. But specifically, I say that if a fact is reported as a fact by either the left or the right, but the other side says it isn't, it probably isn't. Now, that's not a 100% rule, but that's a good one to keep you skeptical. If they both report the fact that's the same, if they say a hurricane's coming, you know, pack up your flower bed, there's, it's going to be trouble. But if one says, you know, President Trump uh, ate a puppy, and the other side says, we can't find any evidence of this puppy eating situation, then probably it didn't happen. <laughs> And the the other advice I give is to uh, make predictions based on your worldview. Now, you could put those predictions into the world, tell a friend, tell a spouse, write it down, tweet about it. And then there's a permanent record so you can't have selective memory, which is a, you know, normal human condition where we remember the things we like and forget the things that were unpleasant um, or at least forget things that didn't fit with our view of ourselves would be a better way to say it. 
So once you put it out in the universe, people can go back to you and say, you know how you said Kamala Harris was going to be the next nominee? Here's your tweet, and here's what happened. How's your <laughs> predicting now? Now, of course, I, I fall into every loser think uh, error myself, and uh, it helps that my, my Twitter followers remind me often. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what I recommend is that uh, we we sort of police each other when you fall into loser think because it's so easy it's just a reflex I you know people use analogies when they shouldn't people read minds but they say well in this in this case I'm good at it <laughs> so we all make the same mistakes and I don't mind when people call me out for it and when I make bad predictions. Uh, it's useful for people to call me out because then I can say, okay, why did I get that wrong? And with the case of the Kamala Harris thing, uh, there was some information I didn't have, which was the only thing that mattered, which is she's the worst campaigner in the history of campaigns. <laughs> I wonder if she would win a school president. Yeah, uh, we should see if she could run for school president. Maybe she would win. A small uh, school. Yeah. Not, I'm not talking about a big you know, city school. But yeah. <laughs> suburban, maybe. Maybe a country school. school. Appalachia. <laughs> Well, we're running low on time here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Do you have a final, you know, since you are the modern day Nostradamus? Yeah. If you'd like to like hypnotize our audience or something, here's. And, and give us a, a final prediction. A time of, for you to do that. Uh, when will, why, when why will the world me, end? Give, give me a, a topic in the news and I'll give you my prediction. Hmm. Topic in the news. The apocalypse. See how, I, see how I turned that around. Hmm. But, okay. But. Put the uh, on okay. You. When when will uh, climate change destroy the Earth? Uh, Twelve years. I I've, uh, <laughs> I plan to be dead by then, so we'll be fine. <laughs> you know, here's here's what's going to happen with climate change, and in a way, it's already happening. You, 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 are you familiar with the Generation Four nuclear power? You mentioned it in your book. You that term? Yeah, you mentioned it in your book. I think. Yeah. So for the people listening who haven't heard of it. So the, the regular power plants that exist in the United States and in most places are the old technology. And people don't realize that existing nuclear plants in this country were designed before computers, literally slide rulers. Hmm. Now, uh, the new stuff, and let's say Bill Gates has a big investment in a company called TerraPower, just as one example. There are a number of startups in this field. And what they've designed using supercomputers, which can simulate different fuel and design um, strategies, they've come up with designs which they're ready to test. They just need a, a location that eat uh, nuclear waste as their fuel. So these, these would actually reduce nuclear waste because they eat the existing waste as fuel. And secondly, they're designed so if there's a big problem, they, they not only don't melt down, they just turn off. Hmm. And they just sit there with no nuclear event. So that's what the new designs can do. The, the remaining problem, of course, is the economics. And we know how to solve that by making them smaller and modular. And then you just kind of bang them out in parts. Uh, you know, w Once it's all the same parts... And you say, okay, the United States is going to do a whole bunch of this kind. Mm -hmm. uh, then the economies of scale kick in, and it becomes very rapidly the cheapest technology. Now, the reason I brought it up is you asked me about the future of climate change. And the answer is that whether you think climate change is cataclysmic or you think it's a Chinese hoax, you still <laughs> want to pursue Generation 4 nuclear, and really maybe even before that, some of the safe designs for Generation 3. Because we're real, none. Of, I think none of them have ever. I don't think there's any Generation Three nuclear reactor that ever had a meltdown. It's all the older ones that that we know about. So, um, no matter what you think of climate change, you want as much nuclear as you can get, as fast as you can, as cheap as you can, as safe as you can, and everybody wants that. It happens to be the solution to climate change that's the most productive, along with solar, along with other mm -hmm. green energies. So you don't you don't want to skimp on the other things because they're actually going in a good direction right now. Um, but the smart people will tell you, you, you need to do everything and you need to do everything fast. The people who don't believe climate change is even a problem still like anything that's economical and good and gives you energy and uh, helps underdeveloped countries power up, um, keeps the lights on. I mean, I live in California and they're <laughs> turning state. Well, uh, 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 both of you do, I guess. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the, uh, my house just barely missed the last set of blackouts, 
And I swear to God, I think if the lights had gone out once because of bad management of the state, which is really the, the reason the lights go out, I think I would have just sold my house and moved because I don't want to live in a third world state. So that's the long answer to what's the future of climate change? It's, <laughs> yeah, mine, it's mine. better better safe for nuclear power. Yeah, my power was out for four days last week. Yeah. Brutal. Kyle barely made it well, barely made it through. Um, yeah, it, see, it seems silly that the first generation of nuclear uh, plants, they decided that a good thing to happen when there's a problem is just for the whole thing to melt down. That seems like a silly uh, design decision. <laughs> well, the, the, yeah, the, the, the non-engineering explanation is that the, the older and current designs, if you, the electricity and the power is, is necessary to prevent a meltdown, whereas the new generations, when the electricity goes out, it can't function. It can't do anything. So it just sort of sits there and uh, doesn't melt down. <laughs> so that, that's a pretty big difference. We all need to learn to just sit there and not melt down. Mm. I think. I like. I think we got something good for mm. our lives out of this. Mm-hmm. Wise. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> so wise. <laughs> that, wow. I'm gonna. Can it, I? Any book that I publish, can I put on the back? Ethan Nicole is so wise. And then your name, Scott. Um, yeah, yes, you can you can use that blurb. Okay, thank you. So wise. You just <laughs> you could just shorten it to so wise. So wise. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, your book is out now, Loser Think. And uh, where do you want people to look for that at? Is Amazon all right or uh, everywhere books are sold. We got audiobooks and Kindles and Amazon's always a good place, but uh, um, Barnes and Noble, any place they sell books. All right. Beautiful. Well, Scott Adams has solved climate change for us, and he's bringing the nation together by helping us to stop our loser think. That's right. So thanks for coming on, Scott. You're welcome. Yeah, Yeah. you're welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much. Everybody say thank you. (laughs) All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right, Scott Adams. That was a great conversation with old Scotty Adams. I really liked that. He's a really interesting guy. He is. He's, he's not a normal thinker, so I like that. So my uh, my dad actually told me to ask that first question. I said, I'm talking to Scott Adams. Do you want to have any ideas? Oh, yeah. I like how you, you said, my dad works for a, an aeronautic space corporation or something like that. I was like, NASA? It's like the... Wait, what did I say? Did I say aeronautics? I mean, Whatever you said it was. Aerospace would be... Aerospace the, nautical something space. Did I just make up a No, you a said word? whatever you would... Uh-huh. It'd be like if you were talking about McDonald's and you were like a burger manufacturing restaurant. It's like, it's McDonald's. And you talk to say is that. Well, it's... Everybody knows what it is. I guess I was thinking, I didn't know if I should say, but I've probably oh. said it on the show before. So yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Should it's I Boeing. Say? It's not NASA, actually. Oh, but you said your dad sent your man to yeah. the moon. Right. Because NASA doesn't do anything. They, oh, they just, okay. They contract all the manufacturing. But yeah, but everybody knows what Boeing is. Yeah. All right. Well, whatever. <laughs> We're going to read some uh, hate, not hate mail. We're going to read it. Some uh, from I- a, iTunes reviews. No, not iTunes. A popular podcast. Oh, yeah. Popular <laughs> MP3 distribution, distribution platform, platform. <laughs> with a picture of an apple on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really miss Adam for oh, you want that you want that well it's play? kind of the hate mail section but there's not I mean it's not technically hate mail I really miss Adam Ford <laughs> I can only get like five of these to come up yeah, you have to like thing. scroll and then hit more and it's like yeah it's not very good hmm so we're looking at iTunes reviews because we're so flattered by them and we love we want you guys to know we read them but uh, I also have this issue here where I can't get them to come up. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Oh, see all. Here we go. Um, we should have had some prepared. Yeah. Okay. This okay. is the best podcast I have ever listened to. Despite the Babylon Bee going sharply downhill since Adam Ford left, <laughs> this podcast is one of the best things to come out of the site in decades. Oh, holy cow. I just hit more, and this is like a five-paragraph massive <laughs> review. <laughs> Uh, he says, as a homeschooler, he appreciates the explanation of all the references. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but thank you, Dad's Bud 11. Nice. Dad's Bud. I don't know if it's Dad's Marijuana or Dad's 
Dad's bud. <laughs> <laughs> so needed. Great pod. Much cast. That's from L. Blown Apart. That's a good one. Nice and simple. All right, here's one. Yeah, I want you to read this one, Ethan. The uh, Carmen. Do you have that up yeah, there? I find that. We have to start. It oh, says, I like this guy who referenced my not all banjos hashtag. I was glad to find out I wasn't racist just because I like banjos in my musical choices. All right. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I want you to read I this because really you're the Carmen guy. This is from Yojimbo69. Uh, <laughs> wow. A2J. Can I not say that number? <laughs> yeah. Flower bin. <laughs> this is from Yojimbo. Number, number, number. A2J 2019 style. Yo, what up, fellas? This be Carmen. I just love what you're putting down in the streets, fellas. I remember K-Max was on a while back, and he brought back fond memories of when we gangsters made A2J. I think that's addicted to Jesus is what A2J yeah, is. Yeah. I'm now addicted to your pod. Addictions, you know everybody got them. Keep up the good work. It's so hip and fresh. This pod is the champion. Carmen out like a witch. Seeing the, wait, <laughs> Carmen out like a witch seeing the Holy Ghost. Peace, my brothers. <laughs> There we go. A review from Carmen. I feel like we need a real sound clip of Carmen rapping. Carmen yes. approved. Yeah. See, I love how he raps in that weird old Brooklyn guy. Uh, it's like, he really sounds like your uncle trying to rap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, M in Scorpio says, pretty, comma, funny. <laughs> and then he says... I strenuously recommend this podcast. <laughs> That's good. I like like he's like <laughs> yeah. he's like pulling a muscle. Like, oh, I recommend. <laughs> he's, re- <laughs> he's referencing the Candace Owens episode. Oh, right. did we I do a strain? Oh, I right. strenuously <laughs> object. I strenuously <laughs> object. Someone was very happy here about us having Doug Tenapel on, and that Earthworm Jim is a Christian. Um. This one says, you know who else likes this podcast? Your mom. But they gave us five stars, so I guess that's good. <laughs> some don't make sense. <laughs> There's some. This uh, generic podcast distribution platform is terrible because I can't. <laughs> if you like click away from it, you end up. This one says, often. Losing. The Babylon Bee is often fairly funny. Five stars. I think he was referencing a different hate mail. Oh, uh, we did that once, I think. There's a there's a one star one here. Shall oh, we get one star one? While the Babylon B usually recognizes the potential for satire and the hubris of others, this episode declines into the tire critique of older generations. Oh yeah, we read we that did one. this one. Yeah. We did that one. Yeah, it's kind of funny because we have a lot more reviews now, but it only shows you. Yeah, it's picking and choosing. Well, I guess maybe, maybe if they just click the star, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're writing it. That doesn't show it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, this guy says. <laughs> 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 I love the B. Five stars. When is John Christ coming on for an interview? Not anytime soon. That was, a, that was, this was written a month ago. And uh, I don't think we're going to be having John Christ on. So too soon, maybe? Too soon. <laughs> too soon. Anyway, I just like to say thank you guys for writing these interviews. I mean, these uh, reviews, inter reviews. And uh, we appreciate it. Yeah. Because it gives us warm fuzzies. This Oh, this guy says, be careful. The, the humor is a little bit forced, like it was supposed to be the main thing, right? Thinking Christians know that the main thing is Christ Jesus, not trying to be clever. Just over 50% of the humor is fine. Did we read that one? I feel like we're getting into ones we read. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's funny. <laughs> because we thought it was so fun. bizarre. It's two stars. <laughs> Just over 50% of the humor. Yeah, because we were trying to figure out what the star rating should be if you think 50% is fine. Did we do this one? Okay, I, I think f- we should abandon this right now. I feel. <laughs> this guy's happy that we built a paywall. He says, you built the paywall. Oh, yeah. Must be Trump. Five stars for building the wall. All right, let's do like one more if we can find one here. One more. Uh, didn't know what I was missing, says Noah's mom. I do like that this person identifies herself as Noah's mom. Mm-hmm. Like she had a kid. and that's I have a like, brother named Noah. So it's possible. It's uh, my mom. No wonder it's the five star. <laughs> and she says, just when I thought I reached the bottom of the podcast barrel, I decided to give the B a try. Wow. Fantastic podcast and possibly the most honest Christian podcast. Dot, 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 dot. Ever. Yeah. Funny, entertaining, and great content. Don't miss this. 
<laughs> Everybody good. listen to Noah's mom. Yeah, Noah's mom knows what she's talking Noah's about. Noah's what she's doing. I do like the idea that she uh, listened to every podcast on the planet, and there was like, <laughs> there's nothing the bottom else. of the barrel. What's the bottom of the barrel in podcasts? Wasn't it's got to be pretty bad. Isn't it like 200-something new podcasts a day or something? Some crazy they, number. They get launched? Yeah. It's like, wow. I think some fan fiction, like reviewing fan fiction of some like Minecraft adult. I don't know. <laughs> We're down a bad path here. <laughs> Did you see that uh, that little biography that they wrote in the New York Times of that girl who launched the podcast? And she like, oh yeah, do you remember this? It was like, I don't know, it was probably six months ago. Then she like would record them on her phone in the library. And it was like, she, she's like, uh, my podcast is going to be called like the great advice podcast. And yeah. it was like the most generic yeah. idea for a podcast <laughs> you could possibly think of. Was and she real? What was it was that? a real girl. And she like, and she only recorded like seven episodes and then abandoned it. Six or seven episodes and abandoned the whole thing. And she got this whole write up in the New York Times about how hard it is to launch in the podcast space and all yeah, this. That was really weird. And she was all proud of it. Like, she's look, look, they shared my journey in the podcast world. And people are like, you recorded it, you know, yeah. the, the worst <laughs> podcast idea on a phone. Cool ideas. And it was like the ultimate millennial stereotype of like, well, I tried. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know what else I could do to get success. I remember when Conan O'Brien <laughs> decided to do a podcast. This uh-huh. is like well after, I mean, this is recently. He just recently decided to podcast and like all the newspaper stories about were like, like Conan O'Brien uh, is bringing podcasts, making podcasts cool or like, as if he invented the whole idea of having a podcast. Yeah. It was really weird. It's just anyway, There's, we thought of it. Yeah, we did. No, we were way. <laughs> and I remember when we made this podcast, I was like, man, are people even going to want to listen to another podcast? There's so many. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. Well, if you have a certain level of fame, like I, I think some of the people from The Office launch mm-hmm. the podcast and it's like, boom, number one, boom, you know, yeah, instantly. <laughs> because it's just, you can just launch a podcast and you're going to be successful mm-hmm. at that level. For, with us, it was enough of a gamble because what our podcast is so different from our site. Yeah. And nobody really knows who we are. It's we had like, no idea how this was going to go. <laughs> but it's going well. We appreciate yeah, We really enjoy it. It's a whole other outlet than the stories. It's I think completely we really like different. It. Yeah. yeah. It was reassuring, it was was reassuring to find that people actually enjoyed it because yeah. we had no idea what people would think when we did this. Yeah, I saw the Onions launching another podcast. They used to do one, and they're doing a new one. Hmm. And I think it's going to be like satire or comedy, okay. which is what we tried, and it's just not good. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, Onion uh, Onion copying us. Yeah, once again, sad. Well, all right. Maybe, let's was uh, that an episode? That Kyle? was an episode. So let's cut it off, and uh, we're gonna head off into our yacht. <laughs> We're going to kick all the homeless people out and uh, <laughs> the banquet table is only for those <laughs> for those who are dressed the money changers in the robes of welcome. a Babylon B subscription. <laughs> so if you want to do that, you go to Babylon B.com slash plans and you get free. Wait, no, you don't get free. <laughs> free. You do get a free something. <laughs> I love when somebody says subscribe, pay and, money and you, and get, you get free, free this. Yeah, there's actually a legal there's like legal implications when you say the word free oh, for yeah. advertising then mm-hmm. a lot of times it's used wrong but because hmm. if you're paying money it's not free but well thank you anyway law that's law my man. that's my, my legal expertise i'm not a hmm. lawyer but i'm just saying hmm. anyway so go to babylonb.com slash plans you get a little gift sent to you you get uh full length ad free podcasts correct and uh you get some other cool benefits so do that yeah join us on our audio yacht indeed Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, reminding you to go forth and buy a $65 million personal jet using the donations of the ignorant masses. <laughs>